Hey y'all, thanks so much for joining us today at The Heart. My name is Dominic Insinius. I'm the leader of this church community, and I'm so grateful that you have taken some time out of your day in your journey of faith to be a part of what God is doing here in the city of San Marcos. We have a saying around here, you don't have to go to church here to go to church here, and that means you are welcome to enjoy this message from your tablet, phone, or computer, wherever you're watching it on. Big things can happen when we expect God to move, so I pray today that God would speak to you through this message, the message today can encourage you and empower you to move throughout your week and what's next in your life. So enjoy this message. to be here. Like I said, my name is Crystal Sotzenberger. I'm one of the many leaders that we have here at the heart. I'm not a theologian. I love Jesus. I love to study the stories in the Bible and share my experience with you. I learned so much from this community as well, and so I'm grateful to be here with you today. Um, if you haven't noticed, we are in a series called The Only Constant. Someone tell me what's the only constant in life? Change. Nice. Yeah, so we um, here at The Heart, we do what's called a series. So we come up with this idea, and then we take a couple of weeks to walk through that idea and see what God has for us individually and what he has for us as a community. So in the first week, we looked at embracing change, and then Dom talked through navigating change. Last week, he talked about how when we rely on our own internal perspective for our identity, we often resist change. And today when I what I want to talk to you about is I want to talk about the difference between reacting to change and responding to change. Because on the surface they sound like they could be similar, but they're verbs that come have a very very different outcome. Reacting to change is very impulsive. Responding to change takes intention. We're not going to talk about the kind of reacting like if a ball is hit down the third baseline at a t-ball game and the coach catches it and he's reacting to make sure a kid doesn't get hit in the face. Not that kind of reacting. I'm talking about to the situations in our life, to the relationship dynamics that create a change in our life. So before we do that, let's pray. God, I thank you for being a creator who loves us more than we could understand in a thousand lifetimes. I pray that your presence would be powerful here. I pray that for the next 12 to 26 minutes, you know it's a gamble with me, that we could set everything aside, still our hearts, and hear what you have to say in this moment. So when I was about 11 years old, so about 15 years plus 10, give or take, I, uh, I grew up in Pensacola, Florida. If you've never been there, you should definitely go. It's a beautiful place. And there are two things that are very consistent at the beach in Pensacola, Florida jellyfish, and I'm just going to go ahead and dispel the myth. No, you don't do what you're thinking you're supposed to do when you get a jellyfish sting. It's white vinegar. If you do the other thing, all of the locals are just going to make fun of you. So we've all done it. If you've done it, you're no shame. We've all done it. So um, I grew up, you know, in Pensacola, going to the beach all of the time, and as I was thinking through the series, as I was thinking through the change that I am experiencing in my own life, I was reminded of this story when I was caught in a rip current. So if you don't know, a rip current is basically like this narrow path of water that um, goes really, really fast. Typically, you're going to see them where the waves break by maybe like a, a sandbar or a pier. And if you get caught in it, there are a couple of things that you don't do to survive. And um, I looked up some stats. There's like 30,000 people that are uh, rescued from rip currents a year. The water can move faster than eight feet per second, so that's faster than an Olympic swimmer, so I would be a goner. Anyhow, it was Easter. We go to the beach. We're on floats. I ate probably a dozen hard-boiled eggs, and I was collecting seashells, like putting them in my bathing suit because I didn't trust a bucket on the, the shore. No way. So I get caught in 
a rip current. And what you don't do is you don't panic. Because if you panic, what happens is your heart rate speeds up, you make bad decisions, your breath becomes shallow, and you are disoriented. I panicked, obviously. So I get caught in this rip current. I don't even remember who pulled me out, but I get pulled out somehow. And if you're ever in a rip current, what you want to do is you kind of want to float parallel to the shoreline. Uh, you don't want to try to swim against it. You're not going to win. So you want to kind of float parallel to the shoreline. And then once you can tell you're out of it, swim parallel to the shoreline. So I was thinking about that imagery, and I was thinking about how, for me personally, change feels just like a rip current. It's not the initial change that gets to me. It's the change that lives within the change that is really difficult for me and feels like it sweeps me up. Have you ever experienced that, where maybe you had a change in your life, and then all of a sudden you feel like you're in a good rhythm, and the next moment it changes again? Funny thing, when we do these series, I oftentimes find that something in my life is very uh, parallel to the series. So I had a big change in a dynamic that um, I've been walking through for the past couple of years and kind of was a, a trigger for me. And so I'm still kind of navigating what that looks like and learning how to respond and not react to that change. And I imagine you've been there as well. I imagine that you've had some type of scenario in your life, maybe recently, where you're having to uh, decide, are you going to react or are you going to respond to change? I think we need to do a series based off of like the miracles of being able to eat as much queso as you want and not gain a pound. So maybe we'll try that one day. Maybe that'll come true. So I wrote this down for you if you're taking notes. Um, and this says, choosing to respond or react to change will determine the challenges we face through it. So when we decide to approach change in a way of reaction, what is going to happen is that disorientation, right? Reaction creates restlessness in our soul. It creates restlessness in our relationship dynamic. It very much so makes other people build up walls immediately. I have done that for sure. And I was thinking through a couple of, of different things. I was thinking through, like, one example of reaction for me is um, I have a, I work for a couple of different hospitals, and um, I work in a department where we're really much so in, like, a rapid uh, growth phase. We're adding new clinics. We are changing process constantly. And so, um, you know, when you get the email that comes through that it, you're, you've messed up or maybe you're, uh, you didn't give the right process, I always want to be like, per my last email, per my last training, and have a reaction instead of taking a, a step to respond. Another thing I was thinking through of um, with this example is, like, let's say you have a very best friend. Um, many of my best friends are in this room. And let's say it's like you're ride or die. Now, if it's me, we're, we're ride or die till about 8.30, and then you're not catching me. So you got to find another friend. So let's say you have a friend, and they've been with you through you know, this journey the last couple of years. You guys have experienced a ton together. And then all of a sudden, they come up, and they say, hey, I got a job opportunity in another state, and I'll be moving at the end of the month. I'm not going anywhere. Don't worry. So I'm going to be moving at the end of the month. In that scenario, you have a choice to react or respond. My initial lean of what I would typically want to do is maybe disconnect, feel angry, sad, maybe a little short with them, right? Because they're leaving me. How dare you leave me? And that can be something that we do often when it comes to these changes that occur in our life. Maybe a change in your finances or a sudden change where now you become a caregiver. It can feel difficult to take a minute and think through what's the response in this scenario. In that scenario, you tell your friend that you're really sad and that you're going to miss them, but that you support them and you're going to stay in contact, right? Because we have FaceTime and all kinds of things these days. So 
in that scenario, that's just a, a quick little example. And in a little bit, we're going to look at a story of Jesus. Um, he had just uh, entered a temple from the Mount of Olives, and he has this beautiful illustration of the difference between reaction and responding, and there's a really cool lesson in there. But I wanted to um, share a couple of things with you. Uh, we talked a little bit about reaction, and this was the other note I have for you. Maybe the question is less about why we react to change and more about how we choose to respond to it. So some of the benefits of responding to change, right, that allows us to adapt and grow in whatever scenario we're in. Um, it, you know, allows us to become more equipped and resilient to face those challenges in the future because we're taking time to see clearly on what is the outcome that we want, not, as, not what is the present here and now that is difficult for me. The other thing is it leads oftentimes to new opportunities, new experiences, new relationships, and those can be beautiful. Change doesn't always mean it's bad. Even the positive can be very difficult to navigate. I was thinking through this uh, scenario about responding. So I grew up in very much so an era of my mom saying, because I said so. Anybody else? Yes, OK. Um, my mom was a, because I said so. We didn't explain, or I didn't get explained to me why we were doing something or why I couldn't have something. It was just because I said so. And that worked. It made me a resilient kid, so I'm, I'm happy for it. Um, so whenever I had my daughter, she's 11. I know, if you can't tell. Um, so whenever I had my daughter, I just I decided I wanted to parent her differently. I wanted less reaction. I wanted more response. I wanted her to have more choice. So here is how you know if there is a new mom with a toddler in Target, and this kid's screaming, and the mom is like, okay, Johnny. I don't know why their name's always Johnny. Okay, Johnny, you have two choices. You can get this stuffed animal or these blocks. What would you like? And they're not like pulling their hair out. They are on the inside for sure. Then they are doing their best to try to respond. What area of your life could you commit to trying to respond? Is it a neighbor? Is it a person? Is it a scenario? I don't know. That's for, that's for you to determine, right? I wrote this down for you, too. Responding lets us make decisions, while reacting keeps us in a state of restlessness. We talked about that a little bit ago, and honestly, you can, you can see that all over. You can go on Facebook, you can go on Twitter, and you can see people arguing and having these responses that they have to go back and apologize for. Um, our restlessness is so apparent when we are in that reaction phase. So let's look at this um, story of Jesus. If you have a Bible or if you want to follow along, I'm going to be in John chapter 8. And I'll set you up for this story and why I like it. It's a story that a lot of people may have heard of. It's about a woman who gets caught in adultery. And oftentimes the uh, essence of this story is really fixated around forgiveness. And it is a story of mercy and forgiveness and God's grace. But as I was looking into this a little bit deeper, I saw something different. I saw Jesus' uh, response, his silence, his intention with this person created transformation not only in her life but in the lives of everyone around them. So this is kind of the scenario. So Jesus had just come down from the Mount of Olives. This was a place that he also went to often to pray, to get away from crowds. I think he was an introvert that lived an extrovert's life. That is very much so how I am. So he had just come back, and he was teaching in the temple. And he was teaching about the significance of water, what that symbolized. And all of a sudden, the Pharisees, if you're not familiar with that word, they're just religious leaders who had kept the Jewish law, uh, law by law by law, commandment by commandment. Everything was about keeping the law. So they bring a woman in, and I imagine this is not like a, uh, a nice little escort. Basically, they are pulling a woman into the atmosphere, which, as you can imagine, would have disrupted 
and changed so much. So let me read this to you. Jesus walked up to the Mount of Olives near the city where he spent the night. Then at dawn, Jesus appeared in the temple course again. And soon all the people gathered around to listen to his words. So he sat down and taught them. Then in the middle of his teaching, the religious scholars and the Pharisees broke through the crowd and brought a woman who had been caught in the act of committing adultery and made her stand in the middle of everyone. You can imagine the, the getting caught in a shameful act uh, and the disruption that would cause. It goes on to say, Then they said to Jesus, Teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Doesn't Moses' law command us to stone to death a woman like this? The idea here was not that the Pharisees wanted this woman to have justice. They wanted to prove Jesus wrong. He had been talking and preaching about forgiveness, how he came to save us, and they just wanted to prove him wrong. So they were looking for a reaction. Have you ever been in conversation with someone looking for a reaction and you don't give it to them? That's the worst. And very powerful on your part, so I'm proud of you. So it continues to say, tell us, what do you say we should do with her? They were only testing Jesus because they hoped to trap him with his own words and accuse him of breaking the law of Moses. But Jesus didn't answer them. Instead, he simply bent down and wrote in the dust with his fingers. I always stop on that sentence because it reminds me that um, I talk a lot about silence. I think for me, getting away and being silent um, helps to calm my mind because my mind is always going a million miles an hour. I'm always thinking about something, thinking about the next thing that I have to do, what I forgot at the store, I have dishes in the sink. So sometimes I just get away and I have to allow myself to be silent. It's the only time I can reflect on what's going on in my life, what I need versus what I feel I deserve, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so Jesus allowed that silence for self-reflection for the people in the crowd. So he says, angry, they kept insisting that he answer their questions. So Jesus stood up and looked at them and said, let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone. And then he bent over again and wrote some more words in the dust. Upon hearing that, her accusers slowly left the crowd one at a time, beginning with the oldest to the youngest with a convicted conscience, until finally Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing in front of him. So he stood back up and he said to her, Dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn, to condemn you? Looking around, she replied, I see no one, Lord. Jesus said, then I certainly don't condemn you either. Go, and from now on, be free from a life of sin. So in this story, we very seldom in the Bible, first of all, see Jesus looking just for closure in conversation. He's looking for the need of that person. The Pharisees wanted Jesus to give this woman what she deserved, Jesus responded and gave her what she needed. I can think about times in my life where I really, really deserved something very different than what I needed. And if we get so caught up in what we do or we don't deserve, it'll blind us in our next step. I have felt, I imagine some of you too, maybe there's a change in your life and you feel like you don't deserve that. You're not good enough. Maybe it's the promotion. Maybe it's the relationship. And so you don't even take a step towards that because it's too scary. The change is too scary. You don't feel like you deserve it. And then on the other hand, we see Jesus respond to her in grace and what she needed. So that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. When we're debating, do I react or do I respond we have to ask ourselves, what is the outcome that we are looking for here? What is the actual desire? Is this argument, is this debate, is this email going to get what I actually need? And that can be the trickiest part for me, because the reaction feels good for a second. But it also comes oftentimes with a lot of regret. Taking time to respond 
to look at what we need allows us to be honest. And honesty is the bridge from reaction to response. That's how we get from here to there. When we say, this is what I need from you. This is what I need right now for me. This is what you can expect from me. It takes a lot of honesty to be able to do that. Or I'm alone. Don't let me feel like I'm alone. So there is, um, you all have a rock on your seat. That wasn't a, a mistake. So let me tell you a little bit about this really quick. We don't need that. So as I was uh, thinking through the idea of uh, change of, you know, this difference between reacting and responding and the honesty bridge that we just talked about, I came across this word, and it's shama. It's a Hebrew word. The Hebrew language is very active and confusing to me. So if you are a theologian and I said that wrong, don't judge me. We're at church. So this word means to hear and to respond. To hear and respond. What good would it be if we told our kids something, they hurt us, and they didn't go through with that? What good would it be if we were at work, our boss tells us about a project, we have something to complete, we heard and took no action? What good would it be to follow a God who has promises, who we're trying to walk with on this journey of faith, and we don't experience him? Maybe at church or in your, your own time. Like what good would that be? So I want this. Uh, here's the funny thing. So I, I got crafty, and a friend of mine suggested, well, just write a word on the back because I was going to give you black rocks. Um, so I got this thing that you can engrave with. So when you flip this over, it's going to say Shama in the worst handwriting of your life. And so um, it was very, very difficult. But I wanted you to be able to have something to know that you don't have to throw this stone. You don't have to react to the people that are just trying to get a reaction out of you. You are powerful. God has given you a spirit of self-control. He's given you a spirit of gentleness, of mercy. That doesn't mean that you have to be weak and be walked all over. It simply means that you don't have to give your power away. And that's exactly what happens when we, we make the choice to react. We give our power away to the other person. I can't tell you how many times I have done that. I have lived a life from very little to, I don't know, maybe two weeks ago, where I have given my power away. You know, Dom talked last week about how we can, if our identity is just fixated in this external world, that when we experience change, we can crumble, right? So for me, when I think about the validation in a debate or um, in some type of change that maybe it's not the most positive, and I react, I just think about, man, I just really gave my power away in that scenario. And that disrupts my identity. When I make a choice to throw away who I am for a moment, of a jab. And sadly, I'm really good at him. So, you know, Don was talking about being sarcastic and how that's been a journey for him. Um, I can jab, but I've just really, really been trying to stay focused on that is not the reality of who I am. It's not the reality of who I want to become. It's not the presence of what I want to bring in a room, in my relationships, in my friendships, at work. I want to be someone that is steady, someone that can extend intention with love. I want to be a safe place for people to land in really difficult times. And we can all do that. if We tap in to God, first and foremost. And if you're not there yet, that's fine. We're all on a journey, all on a different path, different timing. But like I said, when we were praying, we serve a God who loves us so much, who sees us for who we are right here, right now. There's no check mark that you can get on a box to 
get more love from God. He designed you. He designed you to be who you're going to be in five years, whether it takes you a, a longer path to get there. We're all going to get there. You know, when we were talking about the rip currents earlier, one thing that you have to kind of know about rip currents is they don't just happen on bad weather days. It's a huge misconception. The days where the weather is beautiful. I'll take you all to Pensacola if you'll go with me. When the weather is beautiful and the water is clear and the sun is perfect and you have your crew with you, the rip current happens on those days too. You're going to have changes in your life that are going to feel so beautiful and they're going to be exciting and there's going to be change that lives within that change and you're going to have to learn to embrace it and navigate it and don't resist what God has for you and learning how to respond. So my prayer for you, for me, my challenge for us this week is to take a beat, slow down in the conversations where we're having to think through what is the outcome I want here? Who do I want people to see me as in this moment? Is the jab are the emails what I really want to leave from this scenario? And if not, take your time. Slow down. Choose to respond, just like Jesus did. He didn't back down from a difficult scenario. He didn't compromise how he felt in the moment. He just responded. Can you imagine the life change that occurred for that woman? Can you imagine the life change that occurred for all of those people who backed away and didn't throw a stone? That's a power that we can bring to relationships, to our family, to our children. And we are not going to get there on our own. I'm not. I am definitely not. I need to ask God for wisdom day by day, moment by moment, because I am a flawed human. Not on my outfit, but everywhere else. So that's going to be my challenge for you today. I am so thankful that you made a choice to come spend your Sunday with us. And I hope I get to see you next week as well. And I'm going to pray for us just a moment. So if you can grab your rock. And bow your head and close your eyes. Or don't. It's up to you. It's not an actual rule. Father, I thank you for wisdom. I thank you for in the lowest of valleys, the highest of highs, you remain the same. That your love's never wavering on our behavior. I thank you that you walk beside us through change, embracing it, resisting it, navigating it, learning how to respond to it. I pray that we walk through this week in the power of who you've created us to be, not in a need of validation from others or to be proven right or to win a debate, but simply in the person that you've designed us to be in the lives of those around us. I pray that we can hold on to this little trinket as a reminder this week, and maybe even longer, that you're here, that our identity is in you, and that we're loved. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Y'all, thanks so much for joining us today at The Heart. To find out what is next for you in your journey of faith, I want to invite you to go to theheart.church slash next. See what's in store for you. Get in touch with us. We would love to be able to connect with you and see how we can partner with you in your journey. I hope you have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you soon.